of a webcast that will feature the sustainability programs and accomplishments of the City of Pittsburgh. In this webinar, Pittsburgh's Chief Resilience Officer, Grant Irvin, will explain how the city emerged from the Rust Belt days of the 1980s on a path toward economic resilience and ecological recovery. My name is Dick McGrain with Sustainable City Network's publisher of the online trade magazine, SCityNetwork.com. Along with webinars like the one you're viewing today, we also produce email newsletters, a quarterly print magazine, conferences, and other interactive content specifically designed for civic leaders and professionals involved in the day-to-day -day challenge of building sustainable communities. We reach readers in all 50 states and throughout Canada and with quality and timely information on sustainability best practices, products, and services. We're thrilled that more than 600 leaders from communities across the nation have registered for today's presentation, which is sponsored by Crescent Electric Supply Company, the 10th largest electrical distributor in the United States. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the box provided in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the program. A recording of this webcast and the presentation slides will be available on Friday. You'll receive a link and download instructions tomorrow. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webcast. Grant Irvin serves as Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Pittsburgh, where he oversees the integration of sustainability and resilience into city services, programs, and policy. Prior to joining the City of Pittsburgh, Grant served as the Regional Director for 10,000 Friends of Pennsylvania, a statewide smart growth and sustainable development policy organization, and as Public Policy Manager for Pittsburgh Community Reinvestment Group. Grant brings 15 years of experience intersecting the worlds of environmental, community, and economic development and infrastructure policy to create innovative and sustainable solutions for local governments, community development organizations, and state agencies. Grant has helped lead the development of a variety of innovative programs, including Pittsburgh's inclusion in the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, the creation of the Uptown Eco Innovation District, the Pennsylvania Community Transportation Initiative, and District Energy Pittsburgh. So now, Grant, please begin. Thanks, Dick. I really appreciate the opportunity from the Sustainable Cities Network uh, to provide a little bit of insight into the work that we're doing here within the city of Pittsburgh. I put together a few slides here for everyone today to share our experience uh, and look forward to having a, a frank and open dialogue uh, and exchange of ideas. So some of the things that we're, we're really interested in here in the city are, are working on a host of activities, but I wanted to uh, just provide a little bit of a framework with regards to uh, some of the work that we are doing and, and give you a, a little bit of, of kind of a transition and talk about both our background in history uh, as well as uh, our work. Uh, from a, a, a steel city to one that is really based a lot more in kind of advanced uh, technologies, services, finance, and education and medical uh, services. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of insights in, in kind of the work that I do uh, and then talk about kind of the direction that we're working in uh, here in the city in terms of changing culture, uh, changing the way that we approach the issues of sustainability and resilience. Uh, and really uh, trying to drive ourselves as a 21st century city. But to really take this into context, when I thought about delivering this presentation, I wanted to uh, basically combine two presentations in one. So uh, I want to give acknowledgement to my partners at the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, as well as uh, my partners at the, the Green Building Alliance uh, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, a few months ago, we had an opportunity through our speaker series uh, with the Green Building Alliance, and uh, they were asked me to develop some content, and uh, I came up with this concept of one shot. And that's the idea of if you had one shot to improve your city or your hometown or your community, what would you do with that opportunity? 
And that's one of the mindsets that we take uh, in our sustainability and resilience practice here in the city that Mayor Peduto is ingrained in us in terms of our opportunity that we have to help shape and build the city of Pittsburgh uh, into one of the leading cities in the world. You know, a lot of our history, uh, if you think of Pittsburgh, I, I guarantee probably at least 75 or 80 percent of the audience here today would think about pictures on the left that you see. Uh, a heavy manufacturing industry, uh, one in kind of a black and white context with uh, smoke and heavy pollution. And that's a key part of the people that we are and, and kind of the history here. But we've gone through a great transition and a series of great transitions throughout our history. Uh, one from you know, the coal and steel industry uh, to one of, of a modern smart city that is making some really advanced reforms, not just in public policy but in technology uh, and even in the manufacturing space that has really called Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania its home for well over two centuries. So part of our challenge is really looking at how we change conventional wisdom. Uh, when we began our journey here within uh, Mayor Peduto's administration a little over two years ago, uh, we encountered a, a host of civic energy. And uh, one of the key facets of, of the mayor getting elected was he initiated a 1,000-person transition team. And I had the opportunity to help shape the course and lead our sustainability uh, uh, transition and, and really start to listen to the residents and uh, some of the subject matter experts that are working here in the city every day from the public, private, uh, and civil society sectors. And, you know, they gave us some very clear marching orders, you know, to one, to start to benchmark our performance and really look at sustainability as a management tool, not just uh, as part of our mission, but how do we really uh, improve performance of uh, city operations and as of the city's operations. But it was also about us kind of thinking beyond just the context of the 55 square miles that make up the city of Pittsburgh. How do we think of ourselves and interact in a regional context with our direct adjacent neighbors? How do we think of ourselves uh, uh, in a Pennsylvania context, nationwide context, but also in a global context? And what are the lessons that we can learn and what are the lessons that we can provide to other cities uh, to help shape the work that we do every day? Another key aspect that the citizens asked us to do is to really take a different approach to development and really thinking about how we start at a grassroots level with the ideas of rede redesigning and rebuilding communities for the challenges that we face in the modern day. And then finally, how do we really start to become leaders in this idea of civic innovation? Uh, so taking kind of the, the energy from the citizenry and applying it to the work uh, that happens in City Hall every day. And with that in mind, we were able to create a, a kind of a, a different paradigm to our approach with regards to sustainability. And, and that is to think both uh, with the idea of kind of internal aspects as well as external aspects. As a local government, uh, just to put a little bit of kind of framework around it, the City of Pittsburgh is 3,000 employees. We have 300 facilities. We have 1,000 vehicles in our fleet. So that internal aspect is much like any type of mid-sized company or corporation. How are we designing our, our processes to improve the sustainability of our internal operations? But also, as a local government, we have a deep responsibility with shaping the sustainable course of the city as a whole. So really thinking externally in terms of how we can change land use patterns, how do we address infrastructure repair, and how do we really start to shape the city in a way that allows us to endure into the future. With that in mind, we created kind of four key pillars uh, that we base our operations on. At the top, you see the issues of air and water quality, two of the still the major challenges that we face from an environmental context in thinking about how do we reduce pollution, reduce kind of the negative impacts of externalities through manufacturing operations, transportation systems, and even the geography we have that impedes some of the air quality issues that we face as a city. It's also about kind of self-inflicted wounds around water systems and how do we take care of, of our river water quality. 
um, and thinking in terms of a uh, Clean Water Act consent decree, particularly that us, like many American cities, are confronted with, how do we improve uh, those natural systems as well as the, the engineered systems to improve ri river water quality? But the other two key facets on the bottom you see in the diagram here is about building a clean economy and addressing our need for more resilient infrastructure. Aging infrastructure is, is kind of one of the key challenges that we have, and it's the backbone of our economy. How do we invest in that in a way that helps preserve our community character and, and context, but also how do is it that infrastructure provides a framework uh, for a cleaner economy moving forward in the future? which encourages the use of new technologies, of innovation, as well as the applications of new policies that act as enablers. But with that framework, we started to get engaged in kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Um, and fast forward a couple months, we started to look at those lessons learned from the community and how do we start to create a, a next-gen city. And with that in mind, we started to engage the idea of what we call the pivot and the shift. And that's really starting to take into this concept of resilience into our work. So not just thinking at the core root of sustainability, the ability to endure, but our ability to also not just bounce back, but bounce forward in the, in the face of adversity, like shocks that we might face. The slide you see here is, is some of the research that we've been able to develop through the, our partnership with the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. Uh, and the, these items are aspects of what's called our preliminary resilience assessment. So first categorizing kind of those shocks or kind of the immediate negative impacts that can face the city, uh, whether it's an extreme weather event in our case or infrastructure failure, but also those long-standing slow-burning types of stresses that we all acknowledge but we, we kind of deal with, we endure. How do we start to address our stresses so that they don't become shocks uh, in the face of adversity? And we've been able to start to add these, this layer together with the work that we do. So taking you know, a lens of sustainability, but also adding that lens of resilience uh, to our efforts in City Hall. And part of that is about changing the way that we rethink and how we react to the work that we do. So, in our partnership with the RAND Corporation, who is uh, working with us with 100 Resilient Cities program, we started to dig, dive, to dig deeper into our, our work that we're doing and understanding kind of the key strengths, the areas of improvement, and places where we have uh, apparent weaknesses. One of the things I just focus on here on this slide is the areas of key weaknesses. The first bullet point you see about this idea of coordination. One of the things that we've discovered through our, our research and process development is that one of the major challenges we really face isn't one of resource need, but of resource coordination. How do we start to bring together uh, the parties that, that make and play a role in the city each and every day, whether it's utilities or social service providers? How do we bring those resources together in a more coordinated fashion? really impacts the overall resilience of the city. Uh, so that whether that is the delivery of, of human services uh, or really taking care of our most vulnerable populations, that we do it with great intent. We've also discovered uh, from the community that we have you know, a strong ethos in the idea of kind of our environmental and sustainability history. That we have also challenges in, with regards to affordability and the need to grow entrepreneurship. So really, how do we start to bring these efforts together is some of the big attention that we're starting to provide in the work that we do each day. And that allows us to ask this key question, are we willing to make an investment in ourselves? You know, as, as residents and employees within a city, you see these challenges each and every day, uh, whether it's potholes uh, or abandoned buildings, uh, or even on the positive side, the ability to create new, cleaner energy systems. And this really asks us a fundamental question. If we're, the ability for us to succeed really requires that coordination for us to come together. You know, the mayor uses the analogy of, uh, of a story called stone soup. Uh, the idea that, you know, we don't have a lot of resources, but if we, we all come together and put a little bit in that soup pot, then we have the ability to really make something that tastes great. 
And we take that kind of mantra in the work that we do each day in order to leverage the different capacities in the areas of sustainability and resilience. To do that, we've created a structure uh, that allows us to kind of focus on two key aspects. One is the people, the other is the place. So kind of our ability to work towards addressing the basic fundamental needs of people as well as creating equal opportunity across all of our different sectors, all of our different residents in the 90 different neighborhoods that make up the city of Pittsburgh. But it's also about how do we invest in our place, the place that we call home, by fixing our existing infrastructure, by addressing land use decisions and housing and development decisions in a way that helps incorporate the concerns and needs of our people. And we look to design that process in a way to help uh, manage by using what we call uh, three cross-cutting themes, the idea of equity, planet, and performance. So equity, how do we start to create a shared prosperity for all Pittsburghers? Planet, how do we act as good stewards for the resources that have been provided to us? And performance, how do we measure these processes and decision makings that we are designed to help to create a more sustainable, just, and resilient Pittsburgh. So what's next for the city of Pittsburgh? We're really on a, to go back to the kind of the line of, of the pivot, we see ourselves in, in, a, in a very uh, pivotal time in our history. You know, the, the time of steel, the time of mining and manufacturing, uh, and, and our history has been a, a different journey from, from many cities across the country, but similar to many others. So the idea that we can bounce back and bounce forward is something that's been really ingrained uh, in, in those of us that are from Pittsburgh, but also those that are coming to Pittsburgh. They have started to adopt that same ethos and kind of the, the vibe and the energy that exists within the city. So for us, one of the key aspects about that is is to use some of the terminology from the 100 Resilient Cities program is to really think about how we can achieve and design for the resilience dividend. That idea that we can create and solve problems with co-benefits in mind. No longer thinking about processes uh, just like changing light bulbs, for example. Uh, how do we start to look at you know, integrating local suppliers, local manufacturers, how are we designing for a, worse, a, a workforce that understands energy technology better? So really taking a singular aspect, challenge, or problem and designing for a way that has multiple attributes within it. And with that way, we see the ability to find ways to work better together, uh, to invest together. We like to use kind of the analogy uh, and the partnerships that we've created with our local utilities here in Pittsburgh is that you know, whether it's a, a tax bill or a utility bill, that's coming out of the same pocket of, of the residents and the businesses here in the city of Pittsburgh. So how do we design ways in which we can target those investments to leverage capital in a way that, that helps us deliver higher quality solutions? And with that in mind, we were able to create a, a, a shared success across the city. Uh, so that, that's one of the the big kind of ideas that we're starting to integrate into uh, everything from our public works department to city planning to our, our water and sewer authority and other departments as well to create a very integrated approach to the work that we do each and every day. Some of that really starts to take shape uh, probably most acutely within the, the ecosystem services area. Uh, you know, a large part of the history of the city of Pittsburgh has been that, that picture of a, a, a smoky steel town, uh, which, you know, we embrace that as part of our history, but if you come here today, you'll see a, a, a different picture uh, that you will leave with. And one of the key things is, is the environmental quality that we have helped to procure over time. But now we're starting to take it, you know, using that, that, that resilience approach to think about not just creating a park, but creating a park that has different functions. Um, to, we're able to address issues like stormwater capture and improving soil quality and helping to improve the air quality here in the city of Pittsburgh. And that comes out, you know, in, in rather mundane, or unless you're a planner like me, some of the exciting things like planning and zoning activities that will really allow us to shape the course of the next generation for the city. 
One of the other ideas that we're starting to think through is the idea of how do we change our economic development approach uh, to move from one of a very linear progression to one of a more circular economy approach. This idea that our wastes can really be turned into resources. So instead of kind of our, our historic mentality of extracting something out of the ground, uh, making it something through very intense heat and manufacturing processes into a product, consuming it, disposing it, and then reconsuming it again. We're looking at ways in which we can start to reduce our waste, but also find ways in which we can remanufacture from the materials that are created through uh, different municipal systems and manufacturing processes that are currently uh, processes here in Pittsburgh each and every day. One really good example of this is uh, a program that we've worked on with Alcoa, which is a, a, a long-standing Pittsburgh company who has created the NUT, or the Naturally Engineered Water Treatment Facility, which is effectively using uh, residues from the aluminum smelting process and turning it into a re-engineered wetland. Uh, so this kind of idea of, of reuse processes is starting from the highest tech uh, to the lowest tech. So, you know, as we start to transition, you know, the pictures that you see there on the left of your screen, which are actual pictures of right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, in fact, the one on the top screen is downtown Pittsburgh, noon 1955, so right in the middle of the day. Um, has transitioned over time uh, to the pictures that you see on the right, uh, where you have, uh, you know, our redesigned Market Square, which is been an award-winning design venture, uh, the ability to kayak, kayak uh, and canoe and, and use our riverfronts and the rivers themselves as recreation spaces, but also a place where high-quality urban design uh, mixes the future with our past and a way to really position and transition ourselves into the future. So as key parts of that is really starting to think about how we continue this process and evolve. Uh, what I wanted to demonstrate a couple things in key places that we're thinking about uh, and acting upon right now. Uh, on the left hand is a, a, demo, a demonstration of what's called our Eco Innovation District in the Uptown neighborhood, where we are taking processes to build a neighborhood plan that integrates energy, transportation, urban revitalization, uh, and a host of other aspects to really reclaim one of the the great neighborhoods of Pittsburgh and build on some of its strong suits that uh, integrate ideas of affordable housing, of a university partner that's been there for well over a hundred years, as well as hospital and universities uh, that have called the neighborhood home. Uh, in the other quadrant there, you see the area of, of the Lower Hill District, uh, which was the site of the former Civic Arena which is a 28-acre development parcel where we are currently working with uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins and a host of other partners to create another high-quality urban space that provides multiple uh, benefits for the, the adjacent neighbors that connect the Hill District with downtown uh, uh, and really bring together a host of kind of urban amenities uh, right within the core of the city. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, one of the great vision projects that we're embarking upon uh, with a host of foundation collaborators here from Pittsburgh uh, in the Hazelwood neighborhood called the Almano site, uh, which is a 180-acre brownfield, uh, a former Coke uh, manufacturing production uh, works uh, as part of the LTV steel operations, is designed and scheduled to be Pittsburgh's first net zero, potentially net positive, uh, development. So looking at a host of clean manufacturing, uh, research and design space, as well as live work spaces uh, that will be right along the riverfront. So we just finished up with that idea that we have that one shot to really be stewards and leaders within our community, and we hope that we are doing our best uh, to really kind of envision and learn from our past and really take those lessons towards the future of creating a more sustainable and resilient Pittsburgh. So with that, I, I guess I'd turn it over to Randy and would be happy to entertain any questions. 
Okay, Grant, thanks for an outstanding presentation. And we do have a lot of great questions coming in, so let's get right to them. Uh, first question is, what opportunities are there for reclaiming some of the ribbons of concrete and asphalt that are adjacent to the rivers for pedestrian and market activity? Sure, there's, there's a, a, quite a great uh, number of opportunities and we're working on quite a few. Uh, one of the great attributes that Pittsburgh has is a host of uh, civil society, nonprofit organizations that are, are acutely uh, ingrained in a lot of these challenges. One in particular is an organization known as River Life. Uh, and right now our, our Department of City Planning is working with River Life on the development of the city's first Riverfront master plan. So we're looking at some several cases around uh, opportunities uh, to reclaim some of that riverfront space, uh, which also, you know, in, in part of that, in terms of the technical attributes of that, we're also looking at the reuse of some of those materials that have been used as uh, what are called the bulwarks that are used as anti-flooding or flooding protection devices in other types of stormwater capture uh, further upstream. So there's opportunities both in the design as well as kind of the reuse of materials are some of the things that we're doing right now. Sorry, I had, I had it on mute. Sorry about that. Next question is this. Specifically interested in how you can promote energy efficiency in a city with aging buildings and what, ex, what incentives exist for building owners to insulate and install efficient electric options. So ener energy efficiency has been a, a, a key focus of our work uh, here in Pittsburgh in large part of, of partners uh, like the Green Building Alliance and Sustainable Pittsburgh. Uh, just at a high level, one of the things that we've worked on with Sustainable Pittsburgh has been the creation of a program called the Power of 32, uh, which was a regional initiative that uh, started here, uh, a regional vision initiative that started here in Pittsburgh about seven years ago or so. And one of the outcomes of that was to develop an energy efficiency policy, which has helped us, uh, that, that research has really been formative uh, and some of the work that we've been doing with our climate action planning, but also taking that information, uh, Green Building Alliance, along with Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh, have been leaders in uh, the 2030 district challenge from Architecture 2030. In fact, we have uh, our awards event later on this evening. And, and that attention, you know, one, by setting kind of the challenge, I guess, has really started to create uh, a keen interest both in terms of uh, designing technology but drawing attention to building performance. Uh, so a large portion of our building stock, both commercial and residential, is, uh, you know, is of significant age, like many older American cities. So that creates a huge opportunity for retrofit, uh, for integration of technology, um, but also in terms of data and management. Specifically here within uh, our building, the city county building, uh, it, which is uh, going to have its 100th anniversary next summer, we've taken great detail in terms of using tools like submeters uh, as well as data visualization now that we're starting to use both at the management level uh, and the building manager, but also within the employee. So uh, in the next few months, we'll be rolling out some different technologies that will allow employees to identify energy consumption at their workstation. So part of it is uh, a technology, part of it is uh, kind of building upkeep and maintenance, and part of it is uh, finding ways to educate and change behavior. So there's a, a really fertile ground, I think, in terms of, you know, what cities can do and what building operators can do with regards to sustainability and performance in that aspect. All right, next question is, what processes, if any, are you using to plan and track progress? For instance, Envision, Green Roads, and others, and what tools or framework 
are you using to inform and measure your sustainability strategy in the city? For instance, LEED is well known for buildings. Are you using something like that for the city? Yeah, we do a, a host of reporting. Uh, three that I would focus on, and I hope they're not commercials, but uh, I'll, I'll tell them anyways. At, at a global level, we, we participate in the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, which allows us to kind of uh, you know, really provide us uh, an ability to lay out work that we are doing in a pretty comprehensive way and compare ourselves to other cities. At a national level, uh, we use ACEEE, which is a really great barometer uh, that we have found to help us kind of not just uh, benchmark our progress against other cities, but identify other tools that we can deploy to enhance our sustainability. And then finally, I would mention uh, we work with, uh, again, our, our, our partners, the Sustainable Pittsburgh, on what was called the Green Workplace Challenge, which allows us to, to use a host of of tools to, at the local level to kind of monitor uh, more granular performance activities uh, in, in community engagement, uh, employee engagement practices, but also kind of uh, a tick sheet or a to-do list for us. Uh, and likewise, with the 2030 district, that allows us to focus on issues of uh, goals that we have set with the county and Green Building Alliance of 50% energy reduction, water consumption reduction, and we've also added a transportation and working on an air quality metric as well. So those things allow us to really kind of guide uh, ourselves in terms of the, the high level aspects that I mentioned. If you recall in one of those earlier slides about, uh, you know, kind of where our focus areas are, those are some of the tools that we use to help manage our, our key performance indicators. Okay, next question. Are there super fund sites in Pittsburgh and what is being done about them? So, uh, you know, a good example, we've, we've done a great history as part of our economic and, and uh, recovery over the last, you know, 25, 30 years where we've become pretty good at reclaiming brownfields. Uh, I mentioned the Almano site. Uh, right across the, uh, the Monongahela River from the Almano site was the Southside Works, also a uh, former man steel manufacturing facility. The thing that we, we keep in mind, it's important to keep in mind, I would say, is that the reclamation of whether it's a, a, an industrial area or a Superfund site, that it, it takes time, uh, both to kind of remediate and to reclaim uh, those areas as, as you start to kind of work forward. Um, so that the, you, you just have to keep a longer horizon in your mindset that it's a, a, a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, but the, the good thing about that, what I would say is that, you know, Almano, and with the exception of Almano and possibly two other uh, large, uh, large redevelopment sites, the city of Pittsburgh proper uh, has pretty much taken care of the, or have accounted for uh, most of those historic areas. Okay, next question. How does your Office of Sustainability work in conjunction with other city departments to ensure coordination of efforts? Sure. So one of the, one of the, the great things that, that we were able to do when, when Mayor, P Mayor Peduto came into office was that he created one new department and one new bureau. Uh, so I sit in the Department of Innovation and Performance, and then there is the Bureau of Neighborhood Empowerment. The Department of Innovation and Performance was what was traditionally our city's IT department, uh, which handled, handled most of the uh, hardware and software needs of all uh, 19 city agencies and departments. And we still maintain that core competency, but within the Department of Innovation and Performance, we have also added uh, the Office of Sustainability and Resilience, our, our 311 system, which is our, our customer service line, uh, a data and analytics team, our communications team, which is web, telecom, uh, as well as our cable bureau, and then also energy management, which is in part, uh, part of the programming within the sustainability team. And what's really kind of unique about that is that we are, in effect, the service arm of the city. So we're not public works or city planning. 
uh, but we help service those departments. So in locating sustainability and resilience here, it's allowed us kind of that ability uh, to work with other departments relatively easily. Uh, the other thing is the pivot has been to move uh, not just from internal operations, but to also have the department face outward as well. So one of the key things that uh, our director, Deborah Lamb, has taken the leadership on is the creation of the innovation roadmap. And what that innovation roadmap has done, it was a, a really great civic process, but it also brought in all of these different tools that we have within our department uh, and face them outward to the city as well. Uh, so looking at including uh, tech entrepreneurs into sustainability challenges uh, or, uh, you know, looking at different ways uh, that we might use the cable platform to help uh, develop content that, you know, is uh, not just consumable by the citizens but also developed by the citizens as well. Uh, really provides us kind of a unique aspect where we can bring a lot of different tools uh, that have traditionally focused internally out to the community as well. Okay, Grant, next question, um, and I'm sure everyone is wondering this. How is your Office of Sustainability funded? So our, our office is funded as part of a department, so it's a, it's a, a, a general fund allocation. Uh, so we currently have uh, a staff, uh, two full-time sustainability staff, myself uh, and Afton Giles, who is my uh, sustainability colleague. And then through support from the uh, 100 Resilient Cities program, uh, we've added my colleagues uh, Ari Latanzi and Rebecca Kiernan, who is our uh, senior resilience coordinator and uh, resilience analyst, respectfully. And then we've also generated great partnerships uh, with the Student Conservation Association, as well as uh, the newly formed Cities of Service Program Resilience Corps, which has allowed us to bring a lot of uh, young talent into our, our team that uh, allows us to extend our bandwidth a little bit, uh, but also you know, provide kind of unique perspectives to the work that we do. Well, that kind of partially answers the next question, but I'll give it to you just the same. Have you involved Pittsburgh's colleges and universities in the study and planning groups? Oh, you bet. Uh, so this is, uh, I can give you a whole presentation on this, this is just alone. So, so one of the great aspects that we have here in the city of Pittsburgh is a great university uh, and college culture. So uh, we've developed uh, projects with uh, Carnegie Mellon, the University of Pittsburgh, Duquesne University, uh, and, and Chatham University, uh, who has a, a, a great and budding sustainability program in themselves. But each of them brings something very unique to the table. Uh, so within Carnegie Mellon, for example, we've been able to develop a partnership called Metro 21, which has now grown to be called the Metro Lab Program. This is an idea that we, we germinated with our partners at CMU that connects university researchers with municipal problems. Uh, so for example, you know, some of our energy management issues, we were able to connect with the School of Architecture and Schools of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon to start to design uh, you know, kind of our visual interfaces and data collection models. With the University of Pittsburgh, we've, we've been great partnerships both with uh, the Center for Energy, uh, which we've helped to develop the district energy and microgrid program here in the city of Pittsburgh uh, through a lot of great leadership that they've created uh, around the design of DC, uh, DC technology, uh, and as well as the Connect program, which is a, a portion of the Center for Metropolitan Studies at Pitt, where we've crafted uh, a lot of our work around regional stormwater mitigation issues. Duquesne's been a great partner through the Sustainable uh, MBA program. Uh, so uh, students there, we've engaged them in, in several case studies that have now uh, created policies around uh, facilities management, as well as our fleet uh, inventory that they helped us develop, which is creating a lot of our work now uh, in our smart cities efforts. And then with Chatham, uh, we've been really engaged with them on some systems thinking and as well as uh, looking at issues like ecosystem services. So, you know, it, it's really great to have uh, partners like the universities here in Pittsburgh because not just from the students but also the faculty 
as well as the administrative leadership are, are great benefactors uh, and partners to work with because we all call this place home and everybody's working together. Excellent. With the growing city population and aging infrastructure, will there be any initiatives in public transfer, uh, transportation, for instance, uh, light rail systems? So Pittsburgh currently has uh, a light rail system. We affectionately call it the T, uh, which runs from the north shore of, of Pittsburgh through our South Hills, as well as uh, a really great system of, of bus rapid transit uh, that, that goes uh, north, or excuse me, goes south, west, and east of the city. Uh, so we, we work in partnership with the Port Authority of Allegheny County, which is a county entity. Uh, currently, our big focus is on, I mentioned, the Eco Innovation District project, which is really blending together a community plan with a, a pretty holistic transportation uh, design approach. So looking at not just complete streets uh, and pedestrian and, and bike mobility options, but also looking at how you can enhance the transit system as well as parking management. And that, a lot of that thinking is now starting uh, for us to transition into a lot of our work in the smart city space as well. Okay, next question. Do you have an energy benchmarking and a disclosing program in place for the city? We are currently uh, very close to finalizing uh, our draft policy on energy transparency and disclosure. Uh, in fact, just yesterday our project team met uh, to, to look at some of the, you know, the communications rollout and, and uh, next step engagement that we need to take place. Uh, so we'll look to have that policy in place uh, for local governments hopefully later on in 2016 uh, and then uh, for the commercial sector in 2017. Kind of a follow-up question, Grant. Uh, would you be able to speak some more about your local grassroots groups or residents, how they have been involved in the process, especially in terms of priority setting? Sure. You know, to, to the one of the best ways to kind of demonstrate that, I think, is you know, I mentioned the work in our transition team, but with within the 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 resilience planning activities that we've been doing with 100 RC and the Rand Corporation. Uh, one partnership that's been really critical to that has been uh, Carnegie Mellon's uh, Center for Democracy. And we've used uh, what's called deliberative democracy engagement practices uh, in several town hall initiatives in the development of our preliminary resilience assessment. And it's a really, uh, a really great way, one, to get uh, residents to kind of talk with other residents and wrestle with tough issues. But, but to really come to a focused uh, conversation. And that's allowed us, uh, over the, the course of the last few months specifically, you know, we've developed two town halls that have brought together about 150 uh, persons apiece that have really engaged in this, this robust conversation around what it means to be a resilient city. Uh, and a lot of that thinking is interjected, not just in our uh, resilience assessment, will be a, but will be a part of uh, our resilient strategy that we're currently in the process of developing. Okay, next question. Is there a system for recapture or recycling of materials collected during renovation or redevelopment processes? We have a, a, a great local program uh, here in Pittsburgh called Construction Junction, uh, which, which does a really amazing job. It's a, it's a local uh, nonprofit organization uh, in the east end of the city that their, their key focus is, you know, predominantly whenever you're, you're renovating a house or have a project, it works both ways. That you, They will take some of your materials or you can go and find uh, materials there for your project. Um, you know, one of the big issues that we have is that's just one opportunity. How do we start to take great ideas like that to scale is kind of the direction that we'd like to head. Well, that is a terrific idea. Are there any plans to set city limits to growth similar to Seattle to improve density and reduce sprawl? <laughs> um, I would say not at this time. Um, you know, population growth is actually one of the things that we've been collaborating with around several other planning agencies, uh, both at the regional level as well here as uh, 
in the city and, and around Allegheny County to kind of better understand uh, not just what the projected uh, population trends are, but how would we deal with uh, either uh, you know a, a massive population influx or uh, like our history had had demonstrated, what happens when you lose uh, fifty percent of your population? Um, so we've had kind of that experience on a negative slide uh, in terms of a po population diaspora after the eighty two. Uh, 83 recession, which you know really kind of draw uh, drew Pittsburgh down to kind of its, its bottom days in the mid to late 80s. But we've seen kind of an uptick in, uh, albeit slow, in population growth. But one of the things that we've kind of, uh, as part of kind of the mayor's leadership, has done we've done very acutely is that the areas and and the maps that I shared with you on the slide there. Those are areas that are all within the core of the city, uh, along existing transportation lines, within uh, kind of the close proximity of uh, the two key job centers, uh, downtown Pittsburgh and the Oakland neighborhood. So part of our, our overall strategy is really to focus uh, and, and kind of address the demand around urbanization in places, one where we can, we can um, you know, handle that growth or absorb that growth, but also that we absorb that growth in a way that connects people to existing infrastructure, uh, that leverages additional, you know, adjacent job markets, uh, so that it creates a more focused strategy. And, and, and that's probably uh, not a growth boundary uh, like you might see in the Pacific Northwest, but really thinking about how do you make the core even better. Okay. Next question, has there been concern that resiliency approaches are more important than sustainability approaches and how have you managed perceived differences between these? I think somebody asked me this the other day with regards to uh, how, do you, how do you explain uh, these new terms like sustainability and resilience, right? And, and after that you're able to kind of do that, I think one of the key things is that they have to work together, um, and they they can't and should not be uh, competing philosophies. But the ability for for you to endure, but also you know, and sustain, but also the ability uh, to bounce back and to bounce forward and have an agile ability to respond to whatever adversity that you have, are key things that cities do every day. But to do them with intent uh, and intentionality is something that, that we're trying to develop a, a mindset around. Okay, next question. Have you been able to uh, engage with civil society organizations outside of the environmental space, uh, like those who focus on issues of race and inequity? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, uh, you know, kind of one of the, the great things about the resilience conversation uh, that we've been engaged in is that uh, a couple things. One is that you, you, we're effectively trying to break down silos, right? And one of the things is that every sector will think about resilience different. Uh, so, you know, whether it's a, a community development organization or a race and equity organization or an energy, uh, resilience comes up with a different connotation within each of those areas. Uh, it might have a, a different meaning or a different objective. So as part of our planning efforts, it's really about how do you bring those, those areas together. You know, right now in Pittsburgh, there's a pretty robust conversation that is occurring on the issues of, of race and equity. And one of the things uh, that we've done is to, to work, you know, not just with those organizations, but directly with neighborhood leaders to uh, kind of understand the challenges and needs that they face and how do we build that into our strategy and do it in a way that is, is not just inclusive but stretches across all the efforts that we, we are working together on with that strategy. Um, and the other part of that too is I think listening and learning. Uh, so like a lot of our work obviously from a sustainability standpoint comes from an environmental, uh, an environmental aspect, but how do you bring together those other E's uh, of, of economy and equity into that equation. And, and that's something that, you know, we've, we've attempted to do and we want to get better at. 
um, and it has to be done with, with great intent. Okay, next question. Catherine from Seattle asks, how are you addressing the need for spaces for small and locally owned businesses? We're seeing them pushed out of Seattle and redevelopment happens, which further the, furthers the income gaps, hitting small immigrant and uh, local minority owned businesses disproportionately. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that we, we have done recently, and I mentioned the Bureau of Neighborhood Empowerment, and uh, I have a colleague of mine, Henry Pyatt, who focuses solely on exactly that issue. Uh, so working you know, in, in marginalized or underserved areas and predominantly with the small business sector uh, to make sure that they have what they need, particularly from the services that we provide at City Hall, but also how do you start to uh, connect you know, those businesses with other markets, whether it's local or, or beyond kind of our borders. So one of the things that the mayor has done is, uh, Mayor Peduto has done is to pinpoint, uh, you know, a, a person to really kind of lead that effort. The other thing that we've started to do uh, within our inclusive innovation roadmap is to really engage small businesses uh, that typically might not, you know, think or use technology as a, a course of their daily business. So we've started to provide ourselves uh, and some of the times and talent in our, in our department uh, to those small businesses to really help provide them with some competitive, uh, competitive knowledge bases that you know, will help them uh, improve their business. And then the third area that we've really uh, worked on has been through our Urban Redevelopment Authority, uh, which has been working to provide resources for those small businesses both to help them with their bottom line, whether that's through uh, upgrading equipment or encouraging energy efficiency, uh, or reinvesting in you know their physical plant, whether that's a storefront or a manufacturing space. So you know collectively, we've we've really tried to integrate that in a lot of the existing fabric of of, of the neighborhoods that that we work in every day. Okay, next question. Are there any renewable energy projects or initiatives being integrated into Pittsburgh city planning to be installed on city structures or to be uh, developed on the city's outskirts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we have done some small scale uh, solar thermal projects in several uh, emergency med management facilities that we have. A lot of our focus has been on energy efficiency, but just in the last uh, several months, uh, we've initiated uh, a facilities optimization plan that we, we call it. And, and what that plan will do is look at the entire physical uh, footprint of the city to look at you know, which buildings need to preserve, be preserved or continue to be a part of our service uh, platform, and which ones, you know, frankly, just might not be uh, necessary to kind of the modern service delivery that's required within the city. And a key piece of that then is to understand where we have facilities that make sense for renewables. Um, so we've conducted, as part of this analysis, we're looking at, you know, what roofs need to be replaced, what would be a good candidate uh, for rooftop replacement, etc. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. But the other is we've also started to work with a lot of our authorities, predominantly uh, our Urban Redevelopment Authority and the Pittsburgh Parking Authority and the Sports and Exhibition Authority on using tools like parking garages, um, which first started with uh, the creation of a, a garage lighting code and ordinance, but now that we're starting to see energy efficiency benefits there, we're able to start to pursue kind of that renewable integration in those spaces. The other key piece is that we've, we've developed some really keen partnerships with our local uh, gas and electric utilities that have allowed us to really seek a path in energy innovation uh, that's being really spurred by our university partners as well. So that kind of, uh, you know, uh, tripartite, I guess, of uh, municipal, university, and utility partnership is really starting to pave the pathway for uh, some really big things that we see possible in the near future, including, uh, you know, like solar microgrid, uh, also small-scale wind installation, et cetera. Okay, next question. Where does solid waste management fit into the plan? Is this issue primarily addressed through the circular economy initiatives? That's where we want to go. 
so I think we that my my big line is that we waste our waste. Uh, so, you know, in some of the analysis and benchmarking that we've been able to develop uh, in, in our, our, our first two years of our administration has really looked at, you know, uh, one, kind of our, our transportation patterns, which are 30 and 40 miles respectfully round trip each day uh, to landfills by our worst polluting vehicles, our, our refuse packers. Um, our recycling rates. Uh, while our participation rate is, is fairly good, uh, our recycling rates are relatively low. Uh, you know, so looking between like 17 and 20 percent, and in, while we have even 60 percent participation rates in some neighborhoods. And you know, when you start to bundle that together along with our wastewater treatment facility, uh, which is a county uh, city collaborative called Alcasan. We see some huge opportunities that exist uh, with both municipal solid waste and, and, and refuse as well as uh, kind of the ability to take uh, sewage treatment opportunities uh, to better manage organic materials. So there's kind of a system think that we're starting to initiate that conversation um, because it's not an easy one to have uh, from the standpoint that, you know, if you're not picking up Mrs. Jones's trash, there's there's trouble to pay. So, you know, we, there's a, a very small margin of error and we want to be able to um, be strategic and thoughtful but also make sure that we're providing the residents kind of the services that they need. Excellent. Uh, Hannah comments, I've heard that the city's creation of green jobs that simultaneously employ local residents and contribute to sustainability. Can you describe the sorts of jobs you've created, the resources you've tapped to create them, and how they are contributing to long-term job growth? I mean, one of the things that I would point to directly, again, um, is kind of this area of energy efficiency. Uh, when we think about green jobs, you know, it's, it's, it's not just uh, kind of, you know, things that are green. It's also kind of those things that are, are encourage us to be green, right? Um, the Department of Energy recently released a, a really great workforce analysis about kind of the energy services industry, and energy efficiency was one of the things at the top of the list. So, you know, the idea that, that we've, we've spurned with the idea of encouraging greater energy efficiency really goes up and down kind of the workforce, both from, you know, the, the PhD all the way to the associate's degree uh, with regards to kind of the technical needs and capacity. Uh, so we have a, a great partnership uh, through organizations like the Community College of Allegheny County and Pittsburgh Technology Center. Um, and one thing that we've created over the last couple of years is what's called the Energy Innovation Center here in Pittsburgh. Uh, which is a collaboration between a, a host of local uh, energy service companies that are working together with our universities to kind of build that pipeline of employees in the energy future. So, you know, whether it's insulating a building or installing a, a submeter, we're seeing a lot of folks that are, are where those, those talents are needed in that space. Okay, we've got uh, a couple of questions that are very much related, so I'm going to ask you both at the same time. Uh, Catherine would like to know, is there a push to add more urban habitat areas for wildlife? And John would like to know, have you been able to connect green spaces with wildlife corridors? Yes. Uh, it's funny to say that because I, I just drove past a, 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 a green space today when I was dropping my my daughter off at daycare and uh, I saw a flock of turkeys and two deer. You know, one of the things that I think is uh, kind of the great hallmarks of Pittsburgh is that our, our green space preservation and, and hillside reclamation programs have really been, uh, you know, great leadership by our Department of City Planning, but also, you know, kind of civil service organizations like Tree Pittsburgh, uh, the Allegheny Land Trust and others that have really helped identify, uh, along with our philanthropic community, places that, that we need to preserve, not just from a, a green space provision and introduction of, of you know, kind of habitats for, for animals and wildlife, but also ways to improve neighborhoods. Uh, just a couple years ago, the city of Pittsburgh created uh, 
its most recent park, the Emerald View Park, which sits atop Mount Washington, uh, which it overlooks the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so that that has that preservation, you know, that that park has great, provided a great benefit for that neighborhood. But also, it's a, a key aspect of preserving the hillside and mitigating, uh, you know, landslides, which have been an area uh, a problem within that area. So again, kind of, you know finding ways to create multi-attributional benefits within a project. Um, you know, so th those are a couple things that we've done in that area. Well, it looks like we've run out of time. So if you didn't have a chance to get your particular question answered, please let us know in the brief survey that will pop up following the webcast. Grant, once again, I'd like to thank you for an excellent presentation. And thanks again to Crescent Electric Supply Company for making this webinar possible. We certainly couldn't do it without their support. Okay, that'll do it. Thanks to everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.